any of you know this, but pornography actually has effects besides using up all of your data. In this digital world, we often can feel a sense of anonymity where you can easily Google embarrassing health questions, you can post argumentative political comments that you might not usually say in person, and it can feel like our lives online and off are fairly separate, fairly distinct. And this is something that pro-pornography advocates will often call upon. They'll say that pornography is a fantasy. It's like a movie, it's like a video game. The users know to disengage from that fantasy when engaging in real world interactions. However, we are finding that pornography both reflects and impacts serious realities regarding sexual violence that cannot be simply shed when you turn off your computer or put down your iPhone. So before we begin, I'll go through a quick overview of what we're talking about today. I'll discuss the ways that pornography teaches that women enjoy sexual violence, the role pornography plays in increased verbal and physical aggression, the role pornography plays in sexual offenses, rape myths, domestic violence, sexual abuse, the increasing the demand for sexual exploitation, and I'll touch briefly on the fact that pornography is itself a form of sexual exploitation. Pornography shapes the user's sexual template around themes of degradation, ambiguous consent, and violence. This effect that pornography has on the sexual template is really the key to understanding why pornography and sexual violence are linked. But how is it that what we watch has, can have such a dramatic impact on what we do? That theory can be described best by cognitive script theory. Cognitive script theory is the idea that media provides a heuristic learning model that outlines what we think should be happening in a given scenario, how we think people will respond to our actions, and also what the outcomes of the overall interaction will be. Pornography then becomes a script to navigate real-world sexual experiences. People are looking at pornography and then that's how they think that sex should be, how it should sound, how, it should, um, how the actions should be acted out. They figure that based on what pornography is showing them, that will help them understand what the other person will react to what they're maybe doing. And so pornography is not simply a fantasy because it serves as a template for actual sexual behavior for many users. So what are the lessons that pornography is teaching us? What's the script that we're being given? Pornography teaches that women enjoy sexual violence. Analysis of the 50 most popular pornographic videos found that 88% of them contained scenes of physical violence, 49% contained scenes of verbal aggression. A total of over 3,300 verbal and physical aggressive acts were observed in only 50 movies. There was an average of 11.5 acts um, per scene, per scene of either verbal or physical aggression. There were a few that had none, but there was one that action-packed scene that had 128. 87% of the aggressive acts were perpetuated against women. And this is the most disturbing part, in my opinion, is that 95% of these women's responses were either neutral or expressions of pleasure. So pornography is actually teaching that women think violence is sexy. It's teaching th that often, the majority of the time, sex involves some form of violence, some form of coercion, some form of degrading verbal abuse. Jason, age 14, wrote, guys urinating and defecating on women, women with animals, men torturing and raping women. I've seen it all and so have a lot of my friends. We started off right away with hardcore. It's right there, always in your face. These, so many young men today, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that um, from the other panelists, but so many are watching pornography before their first real sexual experiences, and the porn industry, it makes me mad. The porn industry is changing what a 14-year-old would normally be interested in at that age. 
Maybe he's never had a first kiss, but he's watching these kinds of videos. That's a way that the pornography industry is truly harming men in their development. I think it's important to note as I'm talking about sexual violence, which is often perpetuated against women, that this is not about bashing men. Pornography lies about women and men. It says that women are tools to be used and that men are inevitable predators. It teaches that masculinity is something that is based on degrading another human and that what real men want out of sex is to harm women. And that's not true. It's a lie and we all deserve better. Pornography is linked to increased verbal and physical aggression. And I just turned off my PowerPoint. <laughs> I think I hit a button. Well, thank you. Um, a 2015 meta-analysis of 22 studies from seven different countries found that internationally, the consumption of pornography was significantly associated with increases and verbal and physical aggression among men and females alike. The study concludes, of course, noting that not everybody who watches pornography is going to go and act out and be violent against another person. However, the accumulated data leaves little doubt that on average, individuals who consume pornography more frequently are more likely to hold attitudes conducive to sexual aggression and to engage in actual acts of sexual aggression than individuals who do not. Pornography is associated with sexual offenses and with accepting rape myths. For those who might not be familiar, rape myths are basically a category of beliefs that contain permission-giving attitudes towards rape or sexual assault of any kind. These rape myths can include things like uh, that a woman's wearing a short skirt means that she's asking for it, that wives can't be raped, that men can't be raped, that no really means yes, etc. What we're seeing is that when enough individuals start accepting this rape, these rape myths, it has a broad impact on our culture at large. Porn culture is feeding rape culture in America today. Surveyed college fraternity men, this is from a 2011 study, who used mainstream pornography, expressed greater intent to commit rape if they could be assured that they wouldn't be caught. This change was consistent um, across broad genres of pornography, from very mainstream to BDSM or hardcore torture pornography. Bottom line, all types of pornography use resulted in greater intent to commit rape among those who were surveyed. Results also showed that men who viewed pornography are significantly less likely to intervene as a bystander and again, to accept rape myths. How scary is this for our college campuses, which is where the survey was taken, or for our militaries? We're experiencing so many crises of sexual assault, it's hard to keep up with all of the areas um, in our culture that's experiencing them. And when people aren't willing to intervene, when people think that maybe the woman is asking for it, and maybe they have greater intent to commit rape, that harms our culture overall. There was a study done earlier this year in the UK where they looked at the way that pornography impacted sexual harassment in schools among children. During that um, investigation, one woman wrote, I was in a school where a teacher told me that they had recently had a rape case involving a 14-year-old perpetrator. One of the teachers had asked him, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And, she re and he replied, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex. These rape myths, these ideas, do often have real-world consequences. A meta-analysis of 46 different studies reported that the effects of exposure to pornographic material were clear and consistent across all of the studies, and they found that they put one at increased risk for committing sexual offenses and, again, accepting rape myths. We see that this sexual template that we're being given from pornography, saying that no means yes, that hitting is fun, does then often link with actions. 
Rape and sexual violence are a very serious public health concern in America today. And as a result, we need to be doing everything that we can to combat it, including addressing the way that pornography feeds into it. This is a very serious problem in our culture today. There are many public health impacts of rape. Um, one survey said 58% of female assault victims were physically injured. Only 35% received medical treatment. Injuries often include scratches, bruises, welts, dislocated joints, spinal cord injuries, broken teeth, and of course, internal injuries. Rape survivors lose an estimated 1.1 million days of productivity a year. This isn't even mentioning all of the countless ways that it can affect an individual in his or her relationships or in potential post-traumatic stress. Really, this is only scratching the surface of the harms of sexual assault. And it feels almost crass to mention money in the midst of such overwhelming personal pain, um, but it is also important to note that this doesn't stop at the personal level. This is affecting our communities on such a large scale, economically accounting for medical and victim services, loss of productivity, decreased quality of life, and law enforcement resources. We're looking at $87,000 to $240,000 per rape. Some have started to claim, well, what if online porn actually reduces rape? We've all heard, um, there was a recent statistic saying maybe within the last 15 years, about 30% decrease in rape. That sounds like a pretty great miracle to me. I would think maybe less of us would be in the trenches. Maybe some of us could take longer vacations if that was the case. But I would actually argue that the rape the rate of rape has not decreased in America during the age of pornography. Unfortunately, there are a significant number of under-detected and under-reported rapes in America. One sample of about 1,800 men found 6.4% of them met the criteria for rape or attempted rape, and they were never prosecuted. A majority of these undetected rapists were repeat offenders at 63%, and the majority of them had also committed other acts of violence. The repeat rapists averaged 5.8 rapes each, and these are men that were never prosecuted. These 120 men were responsible for over 1,200 separate acts of interpersonal violence, including rape, sexual assault, child sexual abuse. There's a great report called How to Lie with Rape Statistics that gives us a really clear picture of this as well. Media investigations in Baltimore, New Orleans, Philadelphia, and St. Louis found that police eliminated rape complaints from official accounts to create the illusion of success in fighting violent crime. It makes sense that they would want to do this, right? High rates of rape are hardly a selling point for any community, whether, that, whether you're a politician or in public relations. They used three primary methods um, of decreasing the rates of um, official complaints of rape, including designating a complaint as unfounded, classifying an incident as a lesser offense, which also then gives the invest follow-up investigation less resources or failing to create a written report about the rape at all. Approximately 22% of these over 200 police departments has substantial irregularities in their rape data that indicate considerable under undercounting from 1995 to 2002. These police departments are responsible, responsible for hundreds of thousands of individuals for keeping them safe. And notably, the number of undercounting jurisdictions has increased by over 61% during the 18 years studied. So what does that mean? That means police departments are realizing that it's easier to fudge the numbers than to actually investigate and prosecute rape cases. They're catching on to this trend. I don't have a slide for this, but when the data was then reconfigured, um, a conservative estimate of undetected rapes um, that were then eliminated from these numbers was 79,000 to, sorry, 790,000 to 1 million rapes. 
vaginal forceful rapes that were not reported. And all of this data points to the fact that we might actually be experiencing a rise in the rate of rape in America today in the age of porn culture. If we're serious about combating sexual violence, we must commit to addressing the harms of pornography. I said it before and I'll say it again, this is such a serious problem and we want to explore every single avenue that's available to us to help prevent, to help, help install protective measures for members of our community. This is a wonderful quote. Um, the authorship is fairly contested, often quoted as unknown. It says, I'm not interested in a world where men really want to watch porn, but resist because they've been shamed. I'm interested in a world where men are raised from birth with such an unshakable understanding of women as living human beings that they are incapable of being aroused by their exploitation. And that is what I want to see. That's, I mean, I think that's what we all want to see. Pornography is also linked to domestic violence and to sexual abuse. The use of pornography by batterers significantly increased a battered woman's odds of being sexually abused. Pornography use alone increased the odds by a factor of almost two, and in combination of pornography and alcohol, it increased the odds by a factor of three. We also know that there are so many accounts of pornography aggravating different forms of sexual abuse. This story of Elizabeth Smart recently hit the headlines nationally. Elizabeth Smart is the survivor of a nine month long um, horrible kidnapping incident and she's gone on to be a wonderful, inspiring activist. And recently she spoke out about the way that pornography impacted um, the sexual abuse that she experienced at the hands of her kidnappers. Unfortunately, Elizabeth's story is not as unique as we would like to think. At the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we regularly are receiving Facebook messages even from people contacting us, telling us about ways that their sexual abuse was aggravated, whether as children or in an intimate partner relationship, either in frequency, intense, intensity, or deviancy. Also, I think it's so important to remember that pornography fuels the demand for commercial sexual exploitation. Sexual fantasy is rehearsal for relationships. If you imagine someone else as a mere instrument for gratification, you're literally rehearsing exploitive patterns of behavior towards others in your mind. Not to mention with the chemical release that often follows after watching pornography. The more you picture yourself either using others or being used, the more such encounters will feel familiar and normal. There was a study that came out in January of 2016, um, you can f ask me afterwards and I'll be happy to email it to you, that showed that you, frequent users of pornography were less concerned about the problem of human trafficking. When you view another person as an object, as a means, as maybe less of a person that's being used for your own gratification, that doesn't just affect uh, the people in your, even your personal life. That affects the culture at large. Pornography is linked to increased likelihood of buying and selling sex. An analysis of 101 sex buyers compared to men who did not buy sex found sex buyers used pornography more often, used more types of pornography, and reported that their sexual preferences changed so that they sought more sadomasochistic and anal sex. A Swedish study of 18 year olds found that frequent users of pornography were significantly more likely to have both bought and sold sex than other boys of the same age. So in this study, these boys were more likely to sell themselves for sex than boys who had not been watching pornography. Pornography is a form of sexual exploitation in and of itself. This is something that I think needs to be brought to mind any time that we're talking about this issue and sexual violence, is the fact that pornography is not a movie or a video game. It's not a situation where the slaps are faked or the penetration is implied. Everything that's happening on that screen is happening to a real person to a real woman or man whose body can bruise, whose body can be broken. 
One woman, a former performer, wrote and said, the producer told me that everything would be fine and it would just be like rough sex. They might want me to vomit a little, but it would be easy money. When I was finished with the scene, my throat was bleeding. I had bruises all over my body. My vagina was torn in two places and I ended up with pink eye. I felt so weak, used, and honestly felt like I had been raped all over again. I swore I would never do porn again. Pornography is prostitution for mass consumption. It's a medium where, pro where prostitution is conveyed, whether it's photographs or internet videos, it is allowing for the masses of individuals to derive sexual gratification or stimulation from the prostituted acts of another. These masses of individuals are becoming vicarious participants in sexual abuse of another person. So what can we do? This is such a big problem and ultimately we need all of us together at the table in order to make a real difference. We need a broad, multidisciplined public health approach to address the harms of pornography in efforts to prevent sexual violence. We need NGOs partnering with government or agencies. We need social workers. We need nurse practitioners. We need parents and educational preventative programs. All of these different individuals or some organizations working in concert can make a difference. And the great thing is that we know that these kinds of strategies have worked in the past. They have decreased use of smoking, created large public awareness campaigns. Everybody knows that smoking's bad for you now. They have increased use of wearing seat belts. They've helped create greater awareness about problems like cyberbullying or bullying in schools. We know that this is a model that works. It's something that we have the capacity to, to do. And I just really implore all of you to see ways that you can feed into this model and help create, whether it's educational programs, policy changes, um, or recovery programs that will facilitate this. In the end, I just believe it's so vital to address pornography as a public health crisis. Sexual violence is just one reason for that. And I hope that together we can help to create a cultural shift away from sexual exploitation and towards human dignity. Thank you.